Hello everyone and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to hashtag what the patriarchy where we are planning the destruction of the patriarchy from its roots. Thank you for joining me today. This is Shahnaz and today we're going to talk about menstruation period. From the Sunni perspectives though because I haven't looked too much into the Shia perspectives yet but I do plan to record many more videos on menstruation in the future because this is an important and relevant topic and I love talking about it. I struggled a lot with figuring out how to address this topic. There are so many layers to this conversation. There's so much wrong with the way that we talk about it and the way that we treat menstruants or people who menstruate, most of whom are women. We could have a lot Long conversation on how the community, Muslim community treats or sacred spaces treat individual women when they're menstruating. But I finally decided that the starting point should be one where we talk about privilege. Privilege is when you don't have to think about something or the impact of something because it doesn't affect you. The way that I'm going to do this is by highlighting the subjectiveness of the rules and the laws of menstruation that are created by people who never menstruated. They had the privilege to have this conversation authoritatively without thinking about the impact of the rules that they were coming up with. These rules were not going to be affecting them in any way. These rules were not going to be affecting their spirituality, their relationship with Allah, their relationship with the mosque or with other sacred spaces or with the community and so on. So some sub-themes of menstruation that we're going to cover today very briefly, not extensively, this is just an intro to these sub-themes really, include the following. I'm going to make a case for the subjectiveness of the rulings on menstruation and highlight the privilege of those who created and developed these rules on menstruation by discussing five different points that challenge the patriarchal assumption that menstrual blood or postpartum blood is impure and that we are prohibited, not exempt, prohibited, from praying while on our period. What even is menstruation? What answer do people typically give when we ask why can't we pray and fast while we're on our period, whether because of menstruation or postpartum? Spoiler alert! While people tell us typically that it's because all blood coming out of our body is considered impure, that is not true. I'll also talk about how these ideas of menstruation affect our spirituality and our relationship with Allah and with ourselves and our faith, especially during Ramadan. And what about managing the blood? If we choose to, for example, use a menstrual cup, can we pray while on our period then since the blood doesn't leave our body right away? This calls for a new fiqh of menstruation, by the way, a feminist fiqh ideally, but it certainly calls for a new a revision of the existing rules on menstruation. Now, what about hajj? Can we perform hajj or the umrah while we are menstruating? The patriarchal answer is that sure, yes, you can, but the tawaf, the circling around the Kaaba seven times, can only be performed when you are not menstruating, when you are considered to be in a state of purity. I want us to pause and think about what this means for those of us who menstruate. But you have to know that there are fatwas from people, from male scholars, both historically and in our current times today, people that you would consider very legitimate scholars, like Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, that allow us to do the tawaf while we're menstruating without any condition. And finally, where did these rules on menstruation come from? These technical details, they're not from the Quran. The Quran doesn't prohibit us from praying and fasting while we're on our period. And they're also hardly from the hadiths. The hadiths certainly use a different language. The hadiths suggest something more like an exemption. So I see why people think that it's an exemption to not be to not have to pray when we're on our period, whereas the fiqh makes it prohibition. But even if they are from the hadiths, I argue that the hadiths are not always the source of fiqh, and scholars have historically had no problem and did not hesitate to ignore the hadiths in favor of their own preferences, and their own personal opinions. So, spoiler alert, the details on menstruation of what is pure, what is not, etc., they're non-Islamic, they're extra-Islamic. And I insist even that they are un-Islamic coming from cultures and attitudes that were already in existence at the time that the fiqh was being developed. Recall our discussion from Leila Ahmed's book in a previous episode that we did about how non-Islamic sources became a part of textual written Islam over the course of several centuries to the point where we can't even tell anymore what is Islamic and what is not, what is originally Islamic, what is from the Quran, what is from the Sunnah. But I want to begin by issuing two disclaimers. First, I'm not suggesting at all, and I have never claimed this and I will never claim this, that people who menstruate should be required to pray and fast while on their period. I completely understand 
and I value the fact that so many of us benefit from the from this lack of obligation, from not having to pray and fast while in our period. Some of us go through so much pain during this time that adding yet another responsibility to our lives would be very stressful. My second disclaimer is related to privilege. You see, I'm going to keep emphasizing the fact that the fiqh of menstruation was created by people and developed by people who never menstruated. What I want to clarify is that in my opinion, not menstruating doesn't by default disqualify you from being a part of this conversation or for, for having opinions on menstruation. For example, if you know how menstruation works and you've studied it enough to give an expert opinion, then by all means, please contribute to this conversation. But the problem that exists with the fiqh of menstruation is this. It's almost entirely the opinions and the assumptions of the people who never menstruated. They were not scholars of menstruation. They were not experts on menstruation. They were scholars of Islam. In that case, I think that the right thing to do would have been to defer to people who did menstruate so that they, these men, could understand what the actual impact of the rules that they were creating would be on the people who were going to have to follow these rules. So why can't we fast and pray while on our period? The patriarchy tells us that it's because all, actually most, bodily fluids invalidate certain religious obligatory acts like fasting and praying. These fluids include semen, any fluids released during an orgasm, urine, feces, and blood of any sort, which includes menstrual and postpartum blood. Generally, ritual impurity occurs during or after something like menstruation, sexual intercourse, ejaculation, and childbirth. The problem with this answer? I don't even know where to begin. I want to acknowledge two things here. First, that the scholars historically were not concerned so much with the polluting nature of the blood, but more so with the fear that the blood might drip from her, from the person who was menstruating, and soil or dirty the place that she was praying in, particularly the mosque. And because of this, they actually prohibited, some of them prohibited all women, all menstruating people, from entering the mosque while they were menstruating, but others had a little more sense and decided that only people with a very, very heavy menstruation were not to come to the mosque. Remember this point because I will return to it later. And second, the scholars never claimed that the person who is menstruating is impure. Instead, they said that the person who is menstruating is in a state of impurity. These are two different things, being impure versus being in a state of impurity. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about how the Muslim male scholars who came up with all these rules like menstruation, about what is pure and impure, how they know what they know basically about menstruation and all these technical details of menstruation. They didn't get it from the Quran. The Quran never says that we can't pray or fast while in our period. You would have to read the Quran, the Quranic verses on who is exempt from fasting which includes people who are sick to mean that menstruation is an illness and that's not quite true. Menstruation is not an illness. It can be very painful, so you can get sick during menstruation, but even if we assume that menstruation is a sickness, the Quranic verse doesn't prohibit people who are sick from fasting. Travelers can still fast, for example, if they think that they can manage it. Sick people generally are still allowed to fast if they can manage it, if, they, if their life doesn't depend on it. If anything, the Quranic verse actually explicitly says that it's best for us to fast voluntarily in excess, even if we are sick or traveling and so on. Not requiring it, but also definitely not prohibiting it. It's possible though that people in the past thought that way, that menstruation was an illness, because we didn't have so much knowledge about menstruation in the past. We have a much more advanced knowledge today. Which brings me to mention some basic facts about menstruation. You see, menstruation happens when the lining of the uterus, the womb, sheds because the uterus is just really, really mad because an egg wasn't fertilized. Or perhaps more scientifically, a tissue that existed to support a possible pregnancy is released because, again, the egg wasn't fertilized. The fertilized egg attaches to the uterine wall, but since no fertilization happens, the uterus breaks down the wall that it had built to receive this egg because a uterus is funny like that. Menstruation lasts a different number of days for different people. It can be five days, which is the average. It can be less, it can be more, of course. It can be very painful. Just a side note, by the way, I think a lot about the fact that too many menstruating people, which happens to be mostly women, have to take so many pills every month that the bottle that you're taking the drugs from while worn can cause liver disease or some other kinds of problems. In other words, it's very unhealthy to be taking that many drugs that frequently throughout your lifetime. This is related to patriarchy, and if you think deep enough, you can figure out what the problem here is. 
Changes are happening to the body during menstruation and they can be manifested in emotional, physical, and psychological ways. Different menstruating people will respond differently to these changes. This response is dismissively called PMSing by the patriarchy. So back to our actual conversation again. What's wrong with the idea that the reason we can't pray while on our period is simply because the menstrual and postpartum blood is impure? A lot of problems. First, according to too many sources, semen actually isn't impure. So it's, it, it is a fluid from our body, from genitalia, but it is not considered impure. So don't be telling me that there's no patriarchy involved in this, that gender is not relevant to how we decide whether something is good or bad or pure or impure. Which means that if you have semen on your clothes, you don't have to scrub it off. Um, and you can still pray on it without cleaning, without, without washing it, for example, because it's not impure. And I know that this isn't an equivalent of menstrual blood, but here's my point. The scholars worried about the menstrual blood dripping from the woman and therefore making the place that she was praying in impure. But semen in the same place isn't an issue because semen is not considered impure. That's the privilege that I'm talking about. I find it laughable, the way that this is presented in, in the literature. It's according to the opinions of the scholars, semen is not impure. According to the opinion of people who have sperm, semen is, or sperm is not impure. Second, not all blood is impure. Blood from a wound is not considered to invalidate your prayer or wudu or your state of purity. Okay, did you know, for example, that there are reports about the Khalifa Umar and other male sahaba literally praying while bleeding from a wound and the scholars decided that the reason that that was okay was because and i kid you not the bleeding wouldn't stop and in that case when you're bleeding non-stop and it's not in your control it's totally fine to pray on it and the reason that they thought that that was okay also was because they considered that blood to be from an unusual place why on earth the vagina is not an unusual place to bleed from is beyond me again subjective who decided that the vagina is not an unusual place to bleed from but something like your nose is a totally unusual place to bleed from that makes no sense whatsoever what does this tell us these rules are totally subjective these scholars had enough authority they had legitimacy to declare menstrual blood totally pure on the obvious objective logic that this is something that is essential for humanity's survival it's recurring it's not in anyone's control and oh my goodness how on earth is that not an unusual place to bleed from oh and an interesting thing by the way on menstrual blood the tradition tells us that menstrual blood is dark in color it's thick in texture and it's unpleasant in odor the smell however you should know depends on how you manage it so if you use a menstrual cup which i highly recommend then it has no smell whatsoever because the blood is never exposed to air until you take the cup out and you're ready to throw it out Third, these rules are so subjective that they said that you're only not allowed to pray and fast until the seventh day of your period. This was some scholar's opinion. If your period goes on for longer, then you are suddenly required, obligated, to do a ghusl and pray at, at, and fast as usual. And you would have to perform your wudu for each prayer. What the heck changed? It's the same fluid, and why seven days? Some people say that, oh, it's seven days, or because um, if your period goes on for that long, or for longer this, than seven days, it's not real menstruation. Okay, but they didn't prohibit us from praying and fasting while in our period because of the period, because of the men menstrual blood. They prohibited us from praying because it's bodily fluids coming out of our private areas. And yes, yes, the tradition does distinguish between the different kinds of vaginal blood, there's istihada, for example, which male scholars ruled irregular blood compared to haid, which is menstrual blood. So the idea is that there is regular menstruation and then there's irregular menstruation. When the menstruation goes for longer than a certain amount of days, it's not legitimate menstruation. So yes, I recognize that the, the fiqh makes a distinction between different kinds of blood, vaginal blood, but it is that technicality that I'm interested in because it highlights the subjectiveness of all of this. So I'm questioning here why one sort of blood is treated one way, why we are prohibited from praying when one kind of blood comes out of us, and we're obligated to pray again like normal when a different kind of blood comes out of us from the exact same spot. But here's an interesting thing, you guys. There's a hadith in Bukhari narrated by Aisha where she says, one of the wives of Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, joined him in Atikaf and she noticed blood and yellowish discharge from her vagina and put a dish under her when she prayed. Notice that she doesn't renew her wudu in order to continue this 
this worship, think on your own what this might mean and how this challenges so much of what we know about menstruation and prayer. Fourth, note here though that not all things coming out of your body invalidate your ghusl or your wudu. Vomit, for example, doesn't, or according to some scholars, it doesn't. But that's the point. It's debatable. It's subjective. No logical reason exists for this, just like no logical reason exists for the assumption that menstrual blood is impure. I will say, though, that the vomit one is interesting because some hadiths tell us that the Prophet ﷺ didn't renew his ablution after vomiting in some hadiths, but then other hadiths tell us that he did. The inconsistency is always interesting to look at. Fifth, and this is my personal favorite, okay? The fiqh says that when we are on our period, we cannot, we are not allowed to perform the tawaf during hajj. This comes from a hadith report by Aisha in which the Prophet ﷺ tells her when she's upset that her period has come while they were doing hajj, that she should do everything except the tawaf. And you should know that the language of the hadiths on this matter is one of exemption, not of prohibition. The hadiths and the fiqh tell us that we are to stay in Mecca while on our period and postpone our tawaf for when we have done our ghusl and have achieved a state of purification and the bleeding has ended basically. Now, if you think about this in the context of people living in Mecca or near Mecca or a close by city, right? This makes perfect sense, especially in the seventh century when you know rules of where you can stay for how long, etc., weren't complicated the way that they are today. But today, going for a hajj or umrah is a complicated and political matter. We have borders, visas are required for our stay there, and so on. It's so serious, apparently, though, that at least some historical opinions insist that it's a sin to perform the tawaf while menstruating. Other opinions are that if you have a limited time, then you can go ahead and do the tawaf, um, but you must make some serious sacrifice, like sacrifice a goat or a sheep or a camel, ideally, or something like that, because, you know, you have a lot of money, and uh, why wouldn't you? But to be fair, the sacrifice, this expiation is not considered mandatory by all the scholars. It's seriously disturbing though that these people who are making these rules for us don't want to acknowledge what this means for women. So fortunately, we do have scholars both in the past and in today's time that allow us to perform the Hajj and the Umrah or the Umrah while we're on our period, including the Tawaf, without any restriction or prohibitions or conditions like, oh, you must sacrifice a cow in expiation. The logic that these scholars use is precisely that we can't just go for Umrah or the Hajj whenever we feel like it. There are rules and restrictions, and we can't just decide to postpone our trip for whenever and however long we want. Also, the Hajj or the Umrah both, literally, are a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and if even that, for most of us. So among the scholars who do allow women to perform the tawaf while on their, on their period is someone that I think most of us would least expect, Ibn Taymiyyah, the 13th century scholar who is known to be very extremely conservative and considered by some to be the father of Wahhabism. The point here is that we are allowed to perform the tawaf while on our period. So what does this all tell us? Do you realize how much power these people have? These people who have never menstruated, who have never bled from the vagina, get to decide when our period is legit and when it's not. When it's acceptable for a ritual, when it's not. And side note here, and this is really important, I don't know how much research they did on menstruation, how many women's period they studied to know this, to know exactly how the menstruation works or how the, how the blood looks and all of that. But I have my guesses. The more important note here is that these exact same humans could also therefore issue a fatwa saying that at least during Ramadan, right, which is a month that comes only once a year, it's the most blessed and maybe your last one, your menstruation does not invalidate your prayer or your fast. And you may, if you choose to and if you can afford to do so health-wise and so on, pray and fast while you're on your period, that you are simply exempt but not prohibited from fasting and praying while you're on your period. Just like they decided that our tawaf during hajj is completely valid while we're menstruating. It's that easy, it's that simple, and that's also why it's all about power. But we also have to ask here, okay, let's assume that the menstrual blood is indeed impure, that it can invalidate our fast and prayer and such. What if we manage it in a way where the blood actually stays inside of us and doesn't come out except a couple times a day. Like if we use a tampon or a menstrual cup, which again, I highly, highly recommend. Menstrual cups, in my opinion, are the best invention ever. Because you see, when you use a tampon or a menstrual cup, you insert it inside of your vagina. And in the case of the cup, it collects the blood and can stay inside of you for a good eight hours or so. 
The same thing with the tampon, except instead of collecting the blood, it's absorbing the blood. What this means is that the blood in this case is staying inside of you the way that any bodily fluid does, right? Urine, for example, which is completely fine as long as it's inside of you, but it becomes impure only once it's out of you. All of these impure bodily fluids become impure only after they leave your body. So the question that this raises is, can we pray if we're using a menstrual cup while on our period, because the blood isn't leaving our body, and except a couple times every few hours, when we're throwing the blood away. Then again, of course, menstruation was managed very differently in the past during the time that the fiqh on all of this was being written than it is today. And what that tells us is that we definitely need to rethink our ideas on menstruation and all of these rules on menstruation. Oh, and I almost forgot. Speak of tampons, there literally are male scholars out there who say that tampons are prohibited because tampons are akin to masturbation and cause pleasure. Although the fact that they think pleasure is haram makes me so sad for their wives. And this, beloved viewers, is another reason why you shouldn't listen to people who have never menstruated but are writing about it and telling you things about it authoritatively. I want to acknowledge here that not everyone has safe and healthy ways of managing their period. I don't want to exclude them from this conversation. This tampon and menstrual cup uh, invention is only one layer of this discussion and just one reason why the historical rulings on it, on menstruation, are flawed and don't inherently make sense. I want to return here now to this idea that it's an exemption, um, that we're exempt from praying and fasting during our period rather than prohibited. Why do people think that it's an exemption? Because the language of prohibition is extremely dehumanizing and objectifying and nobody wants to feel like God hates us and thinks of us as pollutants when we go through something that is so natural and necessary and which the hadiths recognize as something totally real and not in our control. The exemption language doesn't make sense because there are a huge set of other restrictions on us besides just not being allowed to pray and fast. Some people even believe that we're not even allowed to read the Qur'an, touch the Qur'an, or even hear a recitation of the Qur'an. And of course, these happen to sometimes be the same people who, you know, insist that we can still do dhikr if we want to continue worship while on our period. This despite the fact, by the way, that there's a hadith in which Aisha says that the Prophet ﷺ used to lie in her lap and recite the Qur'an while she was on her period, which means that a menstruating person is listening to the recitation of the Qur'an while she's on her period. And then there are Muslims who believe that we're not even allowed to go to the mosque while on our period, that not only can we ourselves not pray, but that if we knowingly pray in a congregation, while on our period, then we invalidate the prayer of everyone in that congregation. What a burden to carry! How on earth is this an exemption and not a prohibition? This language is terrible and it's objectifying and dehumanizing. Look, if it was simply an exemption, then no one would be horrified to learn that some of us do choose to fast and pray while on our period. But you tell someone this and the reaction is one of disgust and horror and shock, like how dare you approach Allah while you're bleeding. And of course, recall that famous, very famous, but controversial and absolutely false hadith that there are more women in hell because we are spiritually inferior to men or spiritually deficient and intellectually deficient. Naqasat aqal wa deen, the saying goes, because we do not fast and pray while menstruating. It's so circular, it makes no sense. It goes like this. You're not allowed to pray and fast while on your period. Because you don't fast and pray on your period, which we, which we prohibit you from doing in the first place, you miss out so much. And that makes you spiritually weaker than men, than people who don't have those restrictions. But to be fair, the scholars did acknowledge that this made no sense um, and they didn't hold women accountable for the prohibition. So I mentioned earlier that the scholars did have and do have the capacity, the scholarly capacity, the divine legitimacy to issue a fatwa allowing people who menstruate to fast during Ramadan if they can handle it so that they don't have to make it up and they don't have to miss out on this, on this blessed opportunity. Listen, getting your period in Ramadan is especially hard and in the last 10 days, it's the worst. You're missing out on so much because there's still stigma and there's all these prohibitions and restrictions about what you can and can't do, how you can and can't worship. The policing of our worship is so tragic. 
when you're pe- when you're on your period. Plus, imagine what it's like. And for some of us, we don't have to imagine. We experience this. Having your worship in the most sacred of all months interrupted by your period, a month where every single good act and obligatory act that you fulfill is multiplied by thousands. Yes, sure, we can perform dhikr and do other forms of worship, non-obligatory forms of worship, but that's not the point. And some male scholars, by the way, are familiar with this struggle experienced by menstruants because there are literally fatwas online that allow us to take medications and hormones to delay our periods so that we don't miss out on the wonderful opportunities that Ramadan blesses us with. Now, let's talk a little bit about making up these fasts. Sure, prayers that we miss during our period don't have to be made up, but the fasts do. We have to ask, will we get the same reward for making up the fasts that we miss because of our period that we would receive if we fasted in Ramadan? So, for example, when you're fasting in Ramadan, you're not just fasting, you're doing a bunch of other wonderful things, you're maybe giving charity, you're reading the Quran more frequently, and so on. So all these other good acts and deeds that we perform while making up the fast that we would do when we're, when we're fasting in Ramadan, would we get the same blessings for them? Would we get the same reward? Are they multiplied by thousands in the same way that they are in Ramadan? Whatever the answer is, we have to ask, how do we know that? You have to understand it's coming from human imagination and human desire. So why aren't we asking who even created these rules, this, these technical details of the rules of menstruation, what the sources of those, these rules even are, because they're not in the Quran, like I keep saying. And these specific rules, the technicalities, they're not in the hadiths either. And when they are, there are multiple and contradictory and inconsistent versions which complicate all of these rules or any one majority position. But fortunately, the language of the fiqh rulings on this topic doesn't resemble the language of the hadiths on the same topic. But let's say that the Prophet himself did say we are prohibited, right? Not exempt, prohibited from this. I want us to understand something. The hadiths actually are not always a source of fiqh. There are too many instances when the hadiths are literally ignored by the fuqaha for their own personal opinions and preferences instead. Examples? Check out the laws on female-initiated divorce in fiqh versus in the hadiths. The hadiths tell us one thing and the fiqh gives us a completely different picture. For female-led prayer, the same thing happens. The hadiths indicate one thing, but the men of fiqh go, oh yeah, well, I know there's a hadith in which a woman led at least other women in prayer, but I don't like that women lead prayers at all and even women, and therefore I'm going to prohibit it. We'll talk about female-led prayer in a different episode. That's not my point. My point is that the scholars didn't always stick to the hadiths to make their point, which means that the fuqaha always had and still have the authority, the legitimacy, the power to offer rulings that don't align with what the hadiths say. We need to be asking why they don't take more advantage of that power for the good. And I want to end here with the earlier question about, again, where these men came up with these rulings from. There is an answer to this. They're definitely not from the Quran, and they're not even coming from the hadiths in most cases. So the sources of the fiqh of menstruation are not Islamic. They're coming from somewhere else. They're Jewish, they're Zoroastrian, they're Christian, they're Greek, and there are other religious and cultural laws at the time that the fiqh was being written and developed, which took centuries, right? We talked about that in a previous episode. So did you know, for example, that in Zoroastrian and Christian laws, women are considered impure for 40 days after childbirth? And it's a thing that many Muslims still believe, by the way. You can read more about the background of these laws and ideas and attitudes towards menstruating people or menstruation generally in a book by Marion Katz called Body of Text, The Emergence of the Sunni Law of Ritual Purity. I'll do a separate episode on this book alone another time. And of course, recall our discussion from Leila Ahmed's book about how non-Islamic sources become a part of textual written Islam over the course of several centuries to the point where we can't tell anymore what is Islamic and what is not, what's authentic, what's not, what's cultural, what's, you know, what's not, and so on. All right, I'm going to stop here for now, but I will come back to this topic again soon. This is not over. Thanks for watching. Salam.